Hello and welcome to Transition Tea, the podcast dedicated to demystifying the world of transition and activation planning. I'm your host, Christina Olavidia, Director of Business Development and Communications at Yellow Brick Consulting. Today, we're really excited to have another specialist in the field of transition and activation joining us today. Tom Redding is the Senior Managing Director of Healthcare Services at St. Ange is on the podcast. Tom, welcome to the podcast. Um, Thank you so much for agreeing to be on and join us. Sounds good. Thanks Thanks so much, Christina, for the opportunity to to share. Of course. Well, before we get started, um, I wanted to give you an opportunity to introduce yourself and St. Ange to our listeners. Yeah, sounds good. So again, I'm Tom Redding from St. Ange. Again, I have an interesting background, again, more engineering and more industrial engineering as uh, for the last number of years, called the last two decades. So I kind of got into healthcare about 15 years ago, kind of almost you know, fell into it, quite frankly, and you know, came from more of distribution and manufacturing. And as I started at St. Ange, we were growing our healthcare practice, kind of getting it off the ground. And um, for me, it was just kind of taking my skills as an industrial engineer and kind of applying it to healthcare. So again, it's been a good 15 years and learned a tremendous amount, worked with a lot of different clients. So um, so just a quick thing about St. Ange. Again, as I mentioned, uh, St. Ange is an industrial engineering firm uh, based out of your PA. You know, the good thing is we work with many different industries, not just within healthcare. Um, again, for me, I working more focused in healthcare. Um, again, for us, it's just making those, thinking about new facilities, activation of facilities, you know, improving facilities and helping operations. So, Well, thank you for that overview. While we are joining our conversation today, Tom and I are actually going to be drinking an Earl Grey tea, um, which mm-hmm. I typically am not a huge fan of Earl Grey, but Tom, I have to tell you, I like this tea. What do you think? Oh, oh it's very good. Yeah, no, it's all good. Usually during pre- drink black tea. So this was, it was an interesting kind of mix for me, but no. I was- yeah. I'm an herbal dre- tea drinker myself. So this one was, I, when I saw it, I was like, I don't know if I'm going to like it, um, but it definitely is delicious. Well, listeners, grab a cup, join us as we talk transition. So Tom, thank you for the overview of St. Ange. Can you share with us where St. Ange really fits in the overall transition and activation life cycle of a new healthcare facility project? Yeah, so for us, I mean, we, we started more of the concept design of a facility and, and for us taking it through the end. I think, you know, for us, there might be some really big ideas on the front end where a health system or hospital really wants to think about those, those operational concepts. For, so for us, maybe bringing those technologies or bringing those operational concepts on the front end. And as we kind of work through the design process and get to the end, you know, activating those facilities, it may be a major change from the operational team's perspective. They may not have familiarity with robotics. They may not have familiar with inventory management systems or other types of technologies out there that may be planned for this new facility. So, you know, our ability to kind of and have those big ideas and help them through that, but also help them realize those, those benefits of that, you know, the design intent of that new facility. So it's kind of taking it from that front end to the back end. So again, depending on, on the project and kind of where we can kind of help elevate their, you know, the client's capabilities and, and uh, what they're, what they're delivering to the um, end customer. Well, it seems like a very complex and niche market of the healthcare division. Um, You spoke about how you were in engineering. Is that really what drove you to get into this specialized field in healthcare or where did that start? Yeah, so I think when you you think about healthcare in general, even support services, supply chain, you know, it, it is about thinking about material flow and it's about thinking about the use of, you know, it's a people process and technology. And I think from an industrial engineering perspective, it's thinking about all those things together and, and how do they work effectively, you know, from an operational standpoint of getting the right mix of technology, the right mix of people and, and the workflows to complement something. So for me, you know, bringing those skills into St. Ange was, again, for me, it was refreshing so that I can, again, help the healthcare practice grow that, that practice area to, to leverage that within all these different facilities we're involved in. Very interesting. Well, we've had the benefit of reaping the benefits of working with you on several different projects, even though sometimes we're not working on them at the same time. Usually we're taking your data, inputting it into the workflow planning that we're doing. Can you share with us your approach to collecting that data, the simulation events, and the benefits to organizations of doing such such research on these projects? Yeah, so I think when you get into more of what I would say, you know, the simulation of thinking about even material flow, just as an example, 
you know, somebody that is putting in robotics into an, uh, into a hospital, you know, thinking about, you know, the quantifying of all the movements throughout a hospital, all the linen carts and trash carts and supplies and pharmacy and all those things. So for us is to kind of quantify that and, and start to say, what are the implications of from a from a transportation standpoint, from a workflow standpoint? So that would be the output of our work would be, you know, the the timing at which we're doing and getting the end users to understand and buy into, you know, when are materials coming in, when are materials leaving from from the, their departments. And as you guys are working with the clinical teams to get them oriented, it, it's a it's a bigger deal for them to understand, you know, how things are coming and going from from that department. So the output of our simulation certainly allow the end users to understand the implications to, you know, delivering patient care is what their what their job is, their focus. And when you're doing those types of simulations, I know when I was going through my master's program, we learned a lot about Monte Carlo simulations, et cetera. Are you looking at data and trying to find those variances, or is it actually walking through, or is it a mixture? What what's your approach to that? Yeah, so I think it's a mixture. I think one is for us is to understand their operations today and try to start to translate that to say what would be those potential changes. One is it might be the form factor of what's happening in terms of the, the physical movement. It might be the variability of the demand, you know, by time of the day. It might be the fact that, you know, when someone's expecting something to come in in the middle of the night, they're going to be doing their job. In the future, it might change and there might be, a you know, a timing of when things arrive to a particular unit or clinical unit. And to kind of help translate that to say, this is the variability, this is the expected service level of, of getting materials or, or returning of things back to the dock or, you know, that whole kind of point of use of kind of that whole continuum of how do we understand that and, and kind of challenge that to say on a peak day versus an average day versus the 85th percentile day, the system can be overloaded and fail during certain situations where we have to understand kind of what the design intent is and design implications of those. So we can test those and show where the system might may, maybe exceed the service expectations from an end user standpoint. And we can show the impact of that. That's incredibly interesting. We have um, service level agreements is something we discuss on our task list. And sometimes folks get a little confused about what we're asking it, this for. And I think you touched on it perfectly. Setting expectations for clinical end users as to when supplies will be delivered or when medications will be delivered, hours, um, how often, et cetera, is so important because what happens in current state probably will change in future, future state based on dock, flow, passive travel, um, just access to the facility. So thank you for that summary because I think yeah, it was no. so helpful. Um, so we've worked on a lot of children's hospitals and as you know, supplies, materials, equipment, there's a lot of different things when taking care of pa pediatric patients, um, neonates versus adults. Um, there's just a lot of different sizes of equipment. Can you share the differences in space requirements for these types of supplies and equipment and how you help organizations plan for that? Yeah, I think when you, yeah, I think you hit it on the head. I think when you think about the, the variability, especially when you get into like beds, you know, or sleep surfaces, you want to call it that, you know, just the, the number of physical different types could potentially increase at 30, 40% over what I would say a traditional acute care location. So how do you plan for that? And how do you understand the variability and usage of those particular um, sleep surfaces is, is a big is a big thing. I mean, if you think about the mix of patients coming in and what is your kind of band of, of this type of sleep surface, and can we plan for those, you know, given that variability of demand throughout the year? I'd love to everything to be a certain size patient all the time, but it doesn't work like that. So for us is understanding what those are and, and, and kind of start to plan around that variability. Um, but the supplies is that supplies and equipment is a huge one because especially around supplies, there's so many different sizes from, you know, if you're talking about, you know, it's a, a neonate to, you know, an infant to, you know, the list goes on as somebody could be 18 years old. And how do you support those? It, it, it definitely can quickly balloon you to, you know, even up to 50% increase depending on, on their population, their mix of things. I think one of the pieces we do challenge the client on is, is, is there a different way to manage all these different variabilities. So it might not just be variability of the size, it might be variability of the suppliers that they're using for those supplies or the equipment to minimize the amount of things that they're that they're using and storing on any given day. So it's just, there's a combination of things to kind of put some boundaries on it, but, um, but there are some potential implications of um, things start to escalate pretty quickly, a number of items and things like that. No, absolutely. We just wrapped a um, inpatient unit, pediatric unit, and I love how you touched on all of the range of pediatric type patients. And I think 
folks think pediatric patients, they think young children, but it goes all the way up to adolescent 18 year old. And I can think of my son who's 14. He's taller than me. He's bigger than me. He probably would need a bigger cuff, a bigger anything, but he is still a pediatric patient. So and you have to plan for that. I mean, you're planning for something that could be years out and, and what that mix of patients are and, and all that. It's a, there's definitely a lot, more, a lot more variability there. Absolutely. I know another specialty area that we've worked on uh, similar projects on is the perioperative space. Um, specifically, there's a lot of complexity behind the red line. Do you have a rule of thumb of how you provide advice to clients when planning for what will be behind the red line, those supply rooms, those central supply locations, SPD cards, all of the complexity that goes into that. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a, we probably could talk hours about that topic, but I would say that um, long story short, I think there's different operating models when it comes to, especially SPD and OR and the kind of that perioperative platform, you know, what you potentially keep in the core versus what you keep centrally from an SPD standpoint could be trays and supplies and, and instruments. So I think for us is, is to understand one is the, the connectivity and the number of floors potentially of ORs to the, you know, the connectivity to the SPD and, you know, how much can we centralize so that so the intent is we don't have to have supplies in multiple locations um, where it potentially could increase or things could be an expired. So, so for us is looking through that journey of what's the, the, the stack of the building, but also the number of ORs and, you know, can we centralize as much as we can to minimize the, one is the cost and also the potential service implication of having all these different things everywhere has to be managed. And when should somebody maybe designing a new hospital right now, when should they start thinking of all of those items specifically for OR because of once the red lines are drawn, it's really hard to move them. And, um, you know, you can't just build an elevator that connects to your SPD. When, when should they start thinking of, you know, the specifications required to support those? Yeah, so I, I would say, I mean, before any any facility project happens, I mean, the, the periop team should really have a strong understanding and supply chain have a strong understanding of how things are configured today and, and ultimately how well is that working? Because if you get into a design project, there's going to be a lot of discussion and a lot of decisions made very quickly as part of the at front end work. And, you know, from an end user standpoint, they may not be, they may be uncomfortable, especially if it comes around mm -hmm. preference card management. And all the things that, that go into, into managing the preference card. So I would say, you know, it's a continual process for people to understand how they're managing their work, how they're managing supplies, the distribution of equipment and trays and, and how stuff gets back to SPD and how often it's happened. So that's something that the, we always say the end user really needs to have a strong understanding before we start making those recommendations and, and kind of guiding them through that potentially a brand new future state that is very different than what it is today. So it's just, again, getting ahead of that as soon as you can. I know a desire often is to you know make it the latest and greatest, innovative, et cetera. Is there a healthy level of change that you think? Is it is sometimes too much change detrimental to the success of those flows? Yeah, I, I mean, I think the level of change might be, um, I mean, everybody talks about robotics and they talk mm -hmm. about workflow automation. They talk about, you know, just overall AI and all the things that go, that potentially could, you know, revolutionize the way we do deliver care and services. But I think there, there is a point for me is understanding the um, capability of the client and their understanding it, and to be able to manage that equipment or manage that robotics or manage, because it's not just, it's, it's a, it's on a case by case basis. Some people that we work with are way more advanced and they could probably take on those things. Others are probably, you know, they're, they're maybe they're on the lower end. And they're still trying to figure out some of the basics. And, and for us, it might be an individual equation to say, listen, this, these, this health system should probably get to this piece first, where others are further along, and let's try to get them to a much further you know, level of service than what they're providing today. So it's not a it's not a, it's on a case-by-case -case basis of you know, the maturity of, of the client, the maturity of the folks that are running the operation. I know when folks are adding a new tower, sometimes a dock is not built into the plan. And so how do you plan around that when a dock is not part of a new tower, it's 28 floors, and now you're gonna to need to provide supplies through a single dock to just fulfill not only the existing facility, but also this new huge space. Yeah, and that does happen. I mean, there, there are times when the, the client, the architect or whoever says, hey, listen, this is the decision the client has made. But the decision might have been made in a vacuum. You know, they they may not even understand 
the timing of uh, when trucks are coming and going from the campus. They may not understand the volumes of things that are going to be coming and going today, let alone how does that project to the future. And potentially the the implication of the time it takes to get something in the campus until it gets to the point of use. Those service exp expectations have to be defined. And yeah. for us is to understand what that gap is. And if we say, listen, we can't, we can't actually meet this service criteria for the end users and for the for the campus, then there's a different discussion to say, you know, can we can we carve out some space for a dock? Can we do something different and bring some support service space closer to the new facility? Because depending on the campus, it might get longer and, and wider versus being more, you know, you know, vertical. And as you look at those different connectivities, you might say, okay, I have to take multiple elevators to get to this new building. That might be a showstopper. And that's something as, as we start to map out the, the travel distances and the frequencies and the volumes and, and the service expectations, we might find out pretty quickly something has to change. And, and, and for us, it's bringing that database, you know, that the data decision database decision making to the process to say, this is what it needs to be and why versus someone just saying, I don't want to deal with this. It's fine. We'll, we'll figure it out later. So it's, it it's really just kind of thinking through that. Just all of your conversation, it seems that folks really need to be making these considerations at design because once the building starts being constructed, you know, it's really hard to make a UCR on a dock, for example. Um, so engaging somebody who specializes like yourself to me just seems highly, highly beneficial and cost saving. Although front end costs really paying off at the end for some of these items. Yeah, no um, doubt. I mean, because it even might be as simple as food moving. You know, so you have perishable things that take could take an hour to get to where they need to be, and it could cause an issue. You know, what I mean, so there's there's implications of it for sure. That's a great point. So supply chain, it really has been a focal point of healthcare for the last few years. Um, we knew we were going to talk about it. And I've actually had the pleasure as I've researched this episode, getting to know you, Tom, virtually, it seems like you have a lot of information to share. Can you provide us an overview of you know, where healthcare organizations were a couple of years ago in their response and what can be done to plan now to prevent us being in that position we were a couple of years ago. Yeah, no, it's a it's an interesting dynamic there because I think there was this um, inherent trust in the distributors and the manufacturers that they would get what they needed when they needed it. Um, I think the pandemic has has basically fractured that relationship to a certain degree, and I think there's a, a lack of trust even further than it was before. Um, that health systems are starting to take the Take things in their own into their own hands and their own you know destiny to say what can I do to potentially supplement in the future and what can I do to potentially create some sort of distribution center or do some warehousing myself or if I, if I can start to be a little more sophisticated about you know how I'm managing supplies across my enterprise I think one of the things you might find is a health system with you know 20 hospitals in the midst of the pandemic they didn't even know what each of the hospitals had in terms of inventory there was no visibility. So it's it's creating a, a need one from a inventory management management of systems and those types of things to get get system wide visibility, and two is kind of that distribution infrastructure to kind of take ownership of certain pieces and parts of of distributing supplies throughout their network. I think the other piece to it is I think as we look at the delivery of care it goes to more home based, and the delivery of supplies and equipment and pharmaceuticals and all that it, it is changing the way. Um, supply chain and distribution happens within a healthcare system. It's a different skill, but I think those are things that as time goes on, health systems will mature and they'll start putting more and more, you know, energy towards home care delivery and management. So there's, there's, a, there's a big shift there. It seems that there's a healthy balance between lean and not lean. Um, because I know a lot of us you know, I'm a lean black belt. I'm sure you have your lean methodologies that you leverage. Um, a lot of us were shifting that way, but when it comes to supplies, there may be a need to evaluate how lean is too lean for an organization. Yeah, I, no, I think it's certainly fair. I think the the point about lean, I think, is is um, more about managing variability than it is anything for health systems, you know, the, the, the variability of demand, the variability of products, the variability of all those things that are interconnected there. Um, but I, I think, you know, the idea that something's just going to be available when I need it is just not, it's not true anymore. I think that's, 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 health systems are coming to that conclusion that 
and I need to be more. One is, can I use data to help drive those decisions? And I can't use my judgment you know, like I used to. Mm -hmm. um, and, and to kind of help make sure that they're being more thoughtful about, you know, spending money and, and where do they keep inventory and, and where do they keep supplies and equipment throughout their network. With these new hospitals that we're opening, and it doesn't necessarily need to be an inpatient hospital. It can be ambulatory, it can be outpatient. Um, we're seeing the rollout of a lot of different supply management techniques. Gone are the days of just um, everyone kind of ordering their supplies, whether it be a weighted system, a our excellence uh, tube in system, there tends to be a lot of rollout. Can you share with us some of the benefits and perhaps some of the requirements necessary from an organization to roll out a system like that? Yeah, I think as you know, especially if you have a larger, again, maybe just an example as a larger facility that you know you there might be ORs and cath labs and other kind of more procedural things. There, there's a, a number of requirements in terms of tracking and tracing those particular products. You know, in, in the course of a larger facility, it might be it might force health systems to say, listen, this is a chance to change the way we do business. It could be leveraging RFID, it could be leveraging vision systems, it could be leveraging, you know, new technologies that are that are coming down the line. And it's uh, you know, as part of that change management is getting getting the organization ready to say, you know, we are we are elevating our care with the new building, but we're also elevating our support services with this new building. So as we help clients through that, I think there, there is a, a time and a, and a place where somebody's trying to figure out what is the right mix of technology and systems for them, because they might not know. And they might say, hey, I'm going to lift and shift what I have versus saying I'm going to lift and shift and transform. So I think it's just a matter of us kind of helping through and helping them select those technologies and helping saying, you know, where is where should you invest that time and energy versus where you should you know, continue to advance what you're already doing. Interesting. So St. Ange offers a lot of different services from supply chain, logistics, SPD, OR, pharmacy, you name it, I think you do it. Is there a favorite of yours from all those services that you say, this is what I really love to do? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I, I would say from an overall logistics standpoint, I, I think it, it's not just even with logistics within a hospital, just the physical movement of things to and from. You know, you might say, okay, well, that's that's pretty simple to move things, but there's a lot of you know service expectations on the on the on the customer side. There's there's management, all of the flow of goods in and out of facility, but then there's also a point where you might say, I have specimens that are moving throughout my network. I need to move those, and I I, need, they, I don't want them to impact my ability to deliver patient care or make a decision for their diagnosis. So all those things are constantly in motion. I think you know, as we even look at you know how health systems or hospitals share equipment. And how do you mm -hmm. leverage those assets and all the things that go into leveraging an overall scale of a health system and multiple hospitals? You know, it's can you, you know, it's, it's all about transportation, internal, external, all those things, you know, keep things moving. If you said, hey, listen, look at look at UPS. UPS is the conduit to commerce, or FedEx is the conduit to commerce and 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 flow of goods from from the manufacturers, distributors to the to the customers. If that's a critical function, if that doesn't work effectively, then the whole chain does not work effectively. So for me, it's that movement of goods, internal and external within, within a health system. It sounds like um, risk management also comes into play a lot. So do you have a technique that you use and what's your idea of risk management? Do you believe in transparent dialogue, um, noting it down? What do you recommend? Because I think risk is an uncomfortable topic for specifically clients when they're opening a new facility? Yeah, I, I think risk for me, maybe it's more of just continuity of services. So if there's a snowstorm or if there's challenges of moving things to and from. So I, I think it's it's managing one is the risk tolerance of the health system and kind of working through one is, you know, maybe if we're talking about a change to a new technology of what's the potential risk if it doesn't work well. And for us is to kind of maybe work through those individually to understand kind of what their potential challenges are internally. You know, maybe it's a political thing internally versus something that is more just they've they've conveyed a certain level of service to their end users. And can they can this potentially do that? But also there's a risk that that it won't work as as intended if, it, if it's not planned correctly. Um, I, I do think as as health systems start to think about a much further you know delivery of care, there is a risk to being consistent with delivery of services and our ability to kind of convey, you know, where there's a potential gap in service or where they need to invest in things to be an uptime of 99.9% .9 versus something that 
has, you know, if the service level is less than that, then it's not as big of a risk to them. So I think for us, it, it certainly depends on the situation. Um, but I think it's for us, it's just understanding where they, where they can, where they've conveyed a certain message and, and, and the recommendations around that to make sure it's successful for them. Well, Tom, if somebody is interested in getting into your field, what are some of the key skills that you feel are necessary to be successful? Yeah, I think there's there's a few. I would say one is they, they should be analytical in nature. So that may not just be, for example, you know, maybe data driven or they're they're good at you know crunching numbers or or you know making recommendations. It might be just being curious enough to understand, you know, what is different from this client versus the other client and, and being a, a strong problem solver of you know, this is something that we've learned from others versus, you know, and, and how does this compare to, you know, this particular client versus a, you know, comparable out there. So one, it's it's about being analytical, one is it being curious, and one is being a problem solver. I think those are the kind of three main things that, you know, somebody, if, if they have those skills or that mindset, I think they'll be very successful in, in uh, supply chain engineering. Well, speaking of curiosity, uh, we're to my favorite part of the podcast where we get to know a little bit more about Tom. So we're going to go through a couple rapid fire questions that folks I have not shared with Tom in advance. So he is hearing for the first time. You game? Sounds good. All right. So favorite season of the year and why? Uh, I would say it's spring. Okay. Um, so one is being you know, in, a, in living in Pennsylvania, it's those four seasons. So I think coming out of winter, you know, it's being able to get outside, start to, you know, work in the yard and, you know, and, and to be able to get, quite frankly, get back on my road bike and get, get back on the road instead of being inside on my, on my bike. So for me, it's that, that's that first chance to get out there and spend a few months, you know, you know, enjoying the weather. Very nice. Spring is always a renewal period. So I love that answer. Um, do you prefer to watch sports or play sports? Um, I would say probably more play sports than, than I would be to watch sports. Yeah. Do you have a favorite sport you like to play? It sounds like bicycling, um, is one, but. Yeah, I would say, I mean, probably not really a sport, probably bicycling and running is probably the two that I, that I probably would, would do. I mean, I, I'm not much of a basketball player. I'll give it that, but, um, or soccer, <laughs> yeah. but yeah, I would I... say probably more running and, and cycling. I love running whenever I, you know, we travel a lot as consultants and um, whenever I have an opportunity, I love to hit a trail or something. So running is my, my go-to as well. Um, If you were stranded on an Island and could only bring one food with you, what would it be? One food. Hmm. My first response would be pizza, but I probably, you know, (laughs) That's probably something I eat probably too much of. What kind of pizza? Just plain cheese pizza. Pizza is delicious, uh, especially yeah. if you get like the right kind of pizza. Um, uh, are you a thin crust or a thick crust person? Uh, probably more thin crust. Me too. Um, <laughs> current favorite TV series that you're watching? Mm. I would say, where am I? Um, yeah, I just finished. I was kind of going back and forth with Billions. I, I watched that for a while. And then I watched Suits for a while. That was old, but I watched that for a while. Those are probably the two that I probably had finished up recently and that are a little bit older that, I, that I've kind of been watching on Netflix and others. I love that about Netflix. You can catch up on a series or learn a series. I just started watching New Amsterdam and I didn't even know about it. And, you know, here it was. And sure enough, I'm working in hospitals and also watching hospitals. So yeah. um, a book that you would recommend to everybody. A book I recommend. Um, hmm. That's a good question. Yeah, I mean, for me, I guess it's, I, I, I probably tend to read things more like uh, what I would call, I can say leadership books, kind of cliche, but I, I think for me, I, there's probably a, a few out there that I would probably, I'd probably read, but um, yeah, and I don't think there's one in particular, I guess that's the piece that I'm, yeah. yeah leadership books in general though so like inspiring um you got your simon sinek your uh bernays all of those types right. or more like like professional books like yeah uh, it's probably like a, like a simon sinek than, than anything because i i think there is there is a point where the um as we as we have you know we're working with people and all those things i think there there is an expectation that the multi-generational it's changing and our our ability to understand you know their particular needs and their interests and and how it might vary 
across the you know the demographic of our of our own employees. Uh, I think that's something for me is just to understand that a little bit more. And, um, and and quite frankly, how does that how does that impact our ability to kind of um, keep people motivated and interested in all those things around the topics that we're that we're involved in? Very good. Um, two more. Your dream summer vacation destination that you have not been to. Bucket list trip. Uh, I would say Bora Bora is probably one that comes to mind. I've always, I always wanted to go, but it's always one of those, eh, I'll get to it at some point. Those little huts, they're always alluring on all of those, um, you know, pictures that we see of vacation that's always there. So, and then the last one, if you could have one superpower, what would it be? One superpower. Mm. It'd probably be to read people's minds is my guess. <laughs> I think in our line of work, I think that would probably apply that's a great one yeah well, no it's interesting because i think sometimes you know you have clients you could see their body language but you know what they're thinking what they say sometimes are two different things so absolutely i think especially when we're in this virtual world as well and no one has their cameras on you wish that you could hear that inner monologue so no doubt well thank you so much tom for joining us on this episode of transition t should our listeners want to learn more about st Ange or yourself is there a linkedin profile you can send them to yeah, I can, I can certainly send that along. Fantastic. Well, thank you for joining us on this episode. Uh, listeners, next time we will be back with another episode with another healthcare leader in the field talking about transition, change management, different projects, and all things transition and activation. Should you want to hear more episodes like this one, please subscribe to our podcast at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you enjoy your podcast. And if you actually want to see this video, please subscribe to our YouTube channel at yellowbrickconsulting.com. Until next time, cheers. Cheers. Thanks, everybody.